Your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 1 tonight as we look at uh, another passage of Scripture in regards to the Christmas account. The title of the message is Surprise, My Plans Are Different Than Your Plans. And going through surprises throughout the Christmas season, I was reading a few months back and reading through this portion of Scripture, Matthew and Mark and Luke, and came across different things that caught my attention about surprise when things don't turn out just like we planned for them to turn out. Now, Christmas Day is often filled with surprises, most of them pretty good, but, but not always. I remember as a young child, uh, my parents had that rule, you can't get out of bed till we get out of bed. Surprise, Mom and Dad, Christmas morning we wake up like 2 a.m., and yet I find myself as a parent strangely having the same rule in my house. I guess what goes around comes around or something like that. Oh, it'll be a great day tomorrow morning. And, and throughout the Christmas stories and different accounts that we have, there are a number of things that didn't quite work out like someone thought they would work out. I think as we've gone along, we've seen some things that will challenge us. And tonight, uh, we'll look at someone who is really, I would say, one of the unsung heroes of the Christmas story. A character who is not given much uh, space to, but really has a larger-than-life role. Speaking of unsung heroes, I, I have a book in, in a digital format that talks about stories in uniforms, about soldiers, and boy, you can just read. I, I can find myself reading that regularly to find out men and women who are just heroes, yet, yet you won't find this particular person in one of those books that he's obviously found in the Bible. I read this particular account. There was a helicopter that was flying towards Seattle when an electrical malfunction disabled all of the aircraft's navigation and communications equipment. Well, due to the extreme haze that day, the pilot had no way of determining the course to the airport. All he could make out was a tall building nearby. So he moved closer to it and quickly wrote out a large sign reading, Where am I? Apparently, the people in the building saw that, and responding quickly, they penned a large sign of their own. It read, you are in a helicopter. <laughs> the pilot smiled, and within minutes, landed safely at the airport. After they were on the ground, the co-pilot asked how the sign helped him determine their position. The pilot replied, I knew it had to be the Microsoft building, because like any computer nerd, they gave me technically correct, but practically completely useless information. They may have been a hero that day, though that is a fictional story. But the player in this account, we'll look at tonight, the, the person, the character that I want to draw our attention to, played a key role, not a useless or, or, or role, but a vital role. And the character's name, Joseph. Joseph, the husband of Mary. If you would look in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, the Bible reads, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I know I preached a message on his name is Jesus, but I love early on in the Christmas account, we're introduced now to our Savior, Jesus Christ. And by his name, it is a description of his character and his work. He will save people from their sins. He says, Joseph, you're going to be a, a part of this picture that's bigger than you, Joseph. It's bigger than what you can imagine. It's bigger than what you can comprehend. It's bigger than anything else you've ever known before in your life. In verse 22, now all of this was, when all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I'll pause there real quick. There's a whole message inside of that particular phrase, Emmanuel, God with us. You and I don't deserve to have God with us. All right? We're awful people. There's nothing in us that, that should deserve that the God, the creator of the universe, the one who is all-powerful, we see in Luke chapter number 2 where he's called uh, the God of the, the, he's called the highest of, of all the gods, he's the highest. 
We don't deserve, we don't merit in us that he should be with us. The Bible says that he loved us and he sent his son to be with us. Emmanuel. Verse 24, Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the time we have tonight. Lord, I thank you for Joseph and his attributes, Lord, his actions. I'd ask that you'd help us as we sit and as I preach, Lord, that our hearts would be turned towards you. That you would quiet maybe some of the thoughts that may be crowding into our mind, Lord, whether they be excitement or may they be concerns. May we take a few moments to meet with you. Lord, would you meet with us? Would you touch us? Turn our hearts towards you. Lord, I pray if there's someone here tonight who has never trusted you and in your son as a savior, that tonight, the night of Christmas Eve, be the night that they turn towards you. Ask for your help tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to look for a few brief moments tonight at this character named Joseph. The husband, of course, of Mary. Later on, we find him in Bethlehem in a, in a stable by the manger. We, we see him a little bit early on in Jesus' life, and then toward the end, he's apparently off the scene. After a few years, when Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he's not mentioned anymore. Some scholars believe that at that point he's passed off the scene and most likely passed away. There's no biblical proof for that, but just he's not mentioned. And so much so that when Christ is on the cross, his mother Mary is there and he turns to one of the disciples and says, Behold thy mother and mother, behold thy son. He's, now Jesus has passed off the responsibility to one of his disciples. And what that means is Joseph has really just a... a a short time here, and, and according to the Christmas account, just in our minds, a small part. But I, say, but I see a very vital role that he played in this Christmas story. I see, first of all, the history of Joseph. I noticed three things about the life of Joseph. First of all, that he was a carpenter. We talked about it briefly on Sunday, that he was a humble man, but carpentry would have, would have taken some skill, it would have taken some hard work. He was probably a rugged man. It was hard work. It was not easy work to be a carpenter in that time frame. Didn't have the power tools that we have. My wife has accused me of buying houses so that I can buy more tools. She may be right on that. But she doesn't complain when I fix something with the tools that I've bought. But, but back then they would have had hand tools and carefully carving and cutting and sawing and smoothing. He would have had an eye for details and attention to details. I am not a carpenter. Some of you men in here are excellent with, with, word, with wood. The, the kind of the model that you're supposed to use is measure twice, cut once. My model's a little different. My model is measure four times, cut once, cut again, go to Home Depot, buy another piece of wood, and cut it right that time. To be a good carpenter, he would have been careful with those things. I admire you men who can really take wood and just see the picture and, and design something and cut that and do it right even the first time. He was a carpenter, a, a hard work, but a, but a good work, a good job. Notice also that he was cursed. He was cursed. Beginning of Matthew chapter 1, the first 17 verses begins the genealogy, the background of Joseph. If you were to trace it back, you would see that his line uh, goes through David. But you'd also notice that there was a particular man in his line. Jaconi, he's called in, in verse number 11, in, or Jaconius in verse number 11, and Jaconi in another passage. And you would notice that, that he was in the cursed line. You see in Jeremiah chapter 22, the Bible says, Is this man Coni, same, uh, same man, a despised, broken idol? And see, a vessel wherein is no pleasure. Wherefore are they cast out, he and his seed, and are cast into a land which they know not. O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless. A man shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. You see, Joseph came from the ruling line of David, but he came through a particular man who had sinned so egregiously, who had so offended the Almighty God that God pronounced a judgment on him and said, no more of your offspring will ever sit on the throne again. There's little doubt in my mind that Joseph knew his genealogy. You see, in Bible times, that was a very, very big deal. Even now, people to some degree, a lesser degree, go through family trees and you trace back where you came from and your parents and your parents' parents and 
But back in the Bible times, especially with the Jewish nation, it was an extremely big deal to know your parents and your heritage. Listen, if you or I were related to somebody very, very famous, I imagine we would know that. Here, Joseph was related to King David. So much so that Joseph could have, if that line was still was still a ruling line. Joseph could have himself sit on the throne, but instead, he was a carpenter. Instead of in a throne and in a palace with all the niceties, he was working with wood. No doubt in a modest place. He was of the cursed line. You see, God had promised to David and Solomon that one of their offspring would sit on the throne for eternity. Joseph knew his heritage. He was a carpenter. He was cursed. But the Bible tells us that he was a man of character. The Bible tells us, it uses this word, that he was a just man. Verse number 29. And not willing to make her marry a, a public example. That word just means his, he was uh, righteous. His testimony was spotless. He was untainted by scandals. He was known to be holy. All bound up in this word just. This was a man of impeccable character, without a whisper of scandal until now. It was merciful, the Bible tells us he was not willing to make her, that's Mary, a, a public example. He was taking no pleasure, he was not looking to, to, be, uh, to be vicious or vindictive to his, his betrothed, his fiance. It really, if you were to describe, to, to, to describe Joseph, he was a man of, of a heritage, of impeccable character, and he was rugged, strong, and gentle. He would fit, it seems like, in any Hallmark movie. I mean, this man, as we look at the scripture, he was, he was just like a man's man. He was strong from the woodwork, yet in a spirit gentle from his reactions. And heritage. I notice not only the history, I notice the humiliation that he faced. Verse number 18 tells us that one day Mary was found to be with child of the Holy Ghost. Joseph didn't know this, and, and uh, he just knew that all of a sudden one day he finds out that Mary is pregnant. We looked at Mary before and the surprise that she had to face, but I noticed that, that, that there was some betrayal there. Now Joseph, at first did not believe the story that Mary told him. I know that. The Scripture tells us that. Because he was not willing to make her a public example. You see, if he had believed her, he would have said, well, you know, we're going to get married. I believe you, but, but he didn't. He thought she had been unfaithful. That's why he just didn't want to publicly humiliate her. You see, in, in, in the Bible times, in this particular time period, um, someone who had acted this way uh, was was definitely not accepted by society. They were shunned. In fact, in the Jewish culture, they could be stoned. Can you imagine the hurt that Joseph would have felt by the betrayal? His fiance was pregnant. I wonder if he thought one day, I thought I knew Mary better than this. I, I thought I knew her character. I, uh, how could she do this to me? How could she treat me this way? I've been nothing but gentle and kind, and, and yet he's struggling in his mind because... I doubt he's never known Mary to be unfaithful or to be deceitful to him before because the Bible tells us of Mary that she would found favor in God's eyes so she was upright and righteous woman as well. Can you imagine the torn thoughts in his mind? So he decided to break up. So Joseph decided to do, to break up. He didn't want to do a public example. He was just going to put her away privately. He said, you know what, apparently, you know, this is a big deal. I, I can't marry this woman. She's done this. So I'm not going to hang her out to dry. I'm not going to be vindictive. I'm not going to maybe respond to the way that I could. And, and who knows that people around him maybe encourage him to respond a certain way. But he said, no, no, I'm going to respond privately. I'm going to put her away. We're going to stop this betrothal. We're done with this thing. And, and though he may have every right, he thought, to expose his fiance, and maybe every right he thought he had to be hurt, and every right to see that she got what was coming to, for her hurting to him this way, there was a surprise waiting for him. 
You see, you could think the surprise was his fiance's pregnant, but that's not the surprise. The surprise comes in the next part, the next verse. I see the herald. Verse number 20. But while he thought on these things, can you imagine the consternation? Can you imagine just what he was going through? While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream. That would have been a surprise to any of us, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. You see, I'd say it this way. Joseph's surprise, what you think you're supposed to do, isn't what you're supposed to do. There's going to be times in our life when what we think we're supposed to do. And no doubt, Joseph may have thought that he was being merciful and kind by not making a public example. But the, the, the angel came and said, Joseph, surprise, what you think you're going to do is not what you're going to do. But what you think your plans are are not. I have better plans than you have. Surprise, my plans are not your plans. I want to tell you tonight in the point of this message that God wants to give us, give you his set of plans. They won't often look like our plans, but his plans take marvelous detours through strange places that on hindsight showcase his amazing plan. You look at Joseph, and we look at this side of it and say, well, of course, Joseph, take Mary to wife. It's all going to work out. You're going to go to, the, to, to, you know, to Bethlehem. It'll be okay. Don't worry about a thing, Joseph. But we only say that because we see it from the back end. Hindsight, like they say, is always, help me, hindsight's always 2020. Every deal you could have gotten is perfect on the back end. Every decision that you could have made is perfect on the back end. You have perfect vision, but Joseph didn't have that luxury. He had an angel in a dream that said, Joseph, surprise, what you think you're going to do is not what you're supposed to do. Joseph, I'm going to tell you what you're supposed to do. The first thing you do, Joseph, you're going to marry Mary. You're going to marry Mary. Well, Lord, it's a big obligation. I do love her, but Lord, you understand what this means. No one's going to understand this, and this is a tremendous obligation. There are times that God will call us to do something that doesn't seem to make a lick of sense. Mary, Mary, and now Joseph, you're going to be in a blended family. Because that son is not your son, but you're his dad, earthly dad. And no one else around you is really going to know, Joseph. No one's going to understand that. And if you tell them and try to explain to them, they're not going to get it. They're going to think, you're crazy. So, Joseph, just do this. And don't try to tell them you saw it in a dream because then they really think you're nuts. And in fact, in fact, having this son, he may even say, you're not my dad. In fact, Jesus did say that. When they found him outside uh, in the temple, Right? And they went back and he said, Wished ye not, didn't you know that I was about my father's business? He said, By the way, Joseph, you're not my father. But Joseph, understand that, that when you marry Mary, there's going to be a tremendous obligation here. But like I already mentioned, Joseph, I believe, as we see in the story and before that, was a man of character, willing to take on this task. He said, Joseph, understand something. I think we see you're going to accept some shame. Accept some shame. No one will believe your story. In Luke chapter number 8, there's an interesting passage where the Pharisees to Jesus says, say, ye do the deeds of your father. They said unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And what some believe that means is that even the Pharisees said to Jesus, we know your history. We know you were born out of an illicit relationship. See, Joseph had to accept some shame. But this is the part I love, the next part, and that's the haste. I love it because uh, verse number 24 tells us what Joseph did. We should have known, but verse 24, the Bible says, And Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. What did Joseph do? He got up. 
and he immediately obeyed. It, that's what it says. He got up, did as the Lord, as the Lord had bidden him. He didn't delay. All right, he didn't, he didn't question. He wasn't the Gideon to say, Lord, are you sure that's what you want me to do? He just obeyed in a simple, childlike faith. He woke up and obeyed. Throughout Scripture, we see examples of men and women who obeyed or didn't obey. I see with Joseph, the example, unlike of Gideon or Saul, who was rejected from being king, but Joseph, who just said, all right, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't get it, but I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to follow you. The question I have tonight is when God speaks, do we obey? How many times does God have to speak for you and I to get it? Sometimes we feel like we're just part of this operation, that we're just dragged along. I read this account of this dog. His name was Tattoo. One night, there was a police officer who saw this car driving down the road. I believe it was in Seattle. They saw this dog or this thing behind it. It was a dog. They turned on the sirens and they pulled the, the vehicle over the car over. And this dog had been leashed, had got stuck in the door. The dog was fine, but had been going 25 miles an hour. As the policeman said, barely putting one foot in front of the other. You know, sometimes that's how we feel. We're just dragged through this life with our leash caught in the door. But Joseph said, all right, Lord, you can have my leash. Take me where you want to go. I'll follow you, Lord. I'll obey. I'll do what you want me to do. You see the haste. Because of that haste, Joseph is incredibly blessed. In Luke chapter number 3, don't have to turn there. In Luke chapter number 3, the Bible tells us that Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. The Bible says, as was supposed, everyone thought, as was supposed, the son of Joseph. And then it makes this little phrase, which was the son of Heli. I won't take all the time now, but if you read Matthew chapter 1, you'll see that Heli, H-E-L-I, is not in Matthew chapter 1, which is Joseph's lineage, but it is in Luke chapter 3, or I'm sorry, Luke, end of Luke 3, and, uh, and Heli actually traces back Mary's line. You may wonder, well, well, why does the Bible then have that other name of Heli with Joseph, who is actually Mary's lineage? And come to find out, as I did some studying, to find out what this apparent contradiction was, it was not a contradiction, that when someone married someone else, they could also assume the lineage of that person. And Joseph, though, was through the lineage of David himself, when he married Mary, all right, there was an allowance that he could now be called the son of Heli, Mary's father as well, which added to back to his plan through David's line or through David's lineage. By following God's plan, by obeying what didn't make any sense, Joseph's obedience paved the way for the gospel. A simple obedience, the gospel, came to fruition. The gospel came to touch all of us. Seemingly small choice with amazing consequences, with amazing effects. See, the gospel is the fact that Christ came to this earth, humble birth in a humble place, in the manger. He came to live and he didn't begin to minister. He walked around and healed people and touched the, touched the blind and caused the sick to be healed and the dead to come back to life. And then after three years, the Pharisees and religious leaders were so angry, they stirred up the people to cry out for him to be crucified. They crucified Jesus. His crime, claiming to be God. John tells us that not only is the claim there, but that he is God. They crucified him on a cross, and he died on that cross while he was on the cross, he said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He said also, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me as the God of the universe turns his back on his Son? Because he bore our sins. See, we're all sinners. We're all doing things to offend a holy God. 
The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. Well, the Bible tells us that God commended, he showed his love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. He hung on that cross, and he said this phrase, it is finished. The Bible uses this phrase, he gave up the ghost. He died. They buried him in a tomb, and three days later, God raised him from the dead to be the firstborn among us. You see, we can accept Christ as our Savior. We can say, God, I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but you sent your son Jesus, and he died on the cross, and I trust in Jesus to pay for my sins. See, that's what the angel said to Joseph. He said, don't be afraid to take Mary, because what's in her is of the Holy Ghost, verse 21, and she shall bring forth the son. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save their people from their sins. By trusting in Jesus and him alone, he'll save us from our sins. That's the gospel. By Joseph's obedience, he paved the way for that. I find even in the life of Jesus that God commends obedience. Someone said this, a housewife spends 18 hours of her day cooking and cleaning and changing diapers and kissing boo-boos. That's probably a little bit low, to be honest. A businessman, they said, spends 12 hours of his community to and from working for a company in a high-pressure job just to be sure he keeps a roof over his family's head. Yet both the housewife and the businessman can settle down at the end of the day and say, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing anything for God. So the question is asked, what makes God smile? See, some of us realize or think that the only reason God smiles, only way God smiles is if it's done inside of a church building. We maybe would give a list like this, missionaries to Africa, well, they get a big smile. All of the missionaries, a medium smile. Pastors of large churches, a big smile. And pastors of medium church-sized churches, a medium smile. And pastors of small churches, a small, small smile. And elders and deacons, they may get a, they may get a medium-sized smile. And Sunday school teachers, a, a bigger smile. And, and, Sunday, and bus routes, a, a medium to large, depending on how cold it is outside. And successful business people, a small smile. People who work secular jobs, maybe no smile at all. Yet the scripture tells us that when Jesus was baptized, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Don't forget that at that time, Jesus was 30 years old. He had not performed a single miracle yet. He had not preached a single sermon yet. He'd never taught a central class. In fact, he'd spent most of his life most likely sweeping sawdust in a carpenter shop. Yet when he obeyed and followed the Lord, God said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Not just pleased, not just mildly pleased, not just a medium smile, but a large smile. I'm well pleased. Apparently, obedience is the determining factor to pleasing our Lord. And I look at the life of Joseph, a humble man, a man of character, and I see simple obedience. As we come to Christmas tomorrow, may we be Christians of simple obedience. May we follow God when he speaks to us. May we follow God as he speaks to us. I ask you, what's God speaking to you about today? He's always trying to speak to us. Our job is to obey. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Example of Joseph. Lord, help us to have that same attitude to obey even when it doesn't make a lick of sense to us. One who would say tonight, Pastor Howell, as you spoke, that God spoke to me. And God's been asking me to do something or speaking to me and would you pray for me that I would obey the same way that Joseph obeyed? You see, Joseph didn't know the stakes. He just obeyed and God did the rest of it. He would say, Pastor, I have an upraised hand. Would you, would you pray for me? God spoke to me as you spoke, and I want to follow God that way. Just slip your hand up, slip it down. We'll see it. Amen. Amen. I want to obey like that. God spoke to me. Amen. 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 I wonder if you're here tonight, and 
you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I wonder if you're here and you've never asked Jesus to save you from your sins. Though you know he's the babe in the manger Christmas, you didn't know he was the one who died on the cross. I wonder if there's one here tonight that's a Pastor Howell. But when you pray for those, would you pray for me? I've, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. And when you pray for those, would you pray for me? I've never trusted him, but I, I'd like to. I'd like to know how would you pray for me. Just slip your head up and slip back down. I'll see it. See, when you pray for the others, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm on my way, on my way to heaven. You know, sometimes at First Baptist Church, some will come and they'll ask to trust Christ as their Savior. They realize that they're a sinner. They realize that they don't deserve to go to heaven. They deserve to pay for their own sin, but that Jesus died for them. And, and he rose from the grave and now he lives in heaven. Help someone pray a prayer like this that goes, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to pay for my sin. But I believe that you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. I wonder tonight if you're sitting here and maybe you've never asked Jesus to save you before. It's that simple. It's not hard. I wonder tonight if you'd be able to in your heart with belief, pray that prayer and mean that. If you could, I'll say it one more time. If you could pray that and mean that from your heart, I encourage you to do that. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you could say, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner, tell him that. He'll hear you right from your heart. I know I deserve to pay for my sin, but, but I believe you died on the cross for me. Would you save me and take me to heaven? I trust you and you alone. I wonder, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's someone here who said, you know, Pastor, I prayed that just now. I've never prayed it before, but I prayed that just now, and I meant that. I'd love to rejoice with you as a pastor, as a preacher of the gospel. If you, if you said, I just prayed that, and I meant that, I've never prayed that before, would you do me a favor? Would you slip your hand up so I could see that and rejoice with you? No one else looking around except myself. He said, I just prayed that. I've never prayed that before. What a wonderful thing for Christmas. Just slip it up, slip it down. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the time tonight. Help us to follow you in obedience. Lord, if there's somebody who's never trusted you, would you work in their heart, Lord? Show them your way in Jesus' name. Amen.